We start things off with the global warming debate. Researchers now say that climate change did not happen gradually in the past, and it will not happen that way in the future. Dr. Richard Alley is an Evan Pugh Professor of Geosciences at Penn State and one of the world's leading climatologists. He studies ice cores, samples of ice that record Earth's past climate in places like Antarctica and Greenland. He talked with us about his research and about why global warming has become his personal crusade. You discovered something 10 years ago that literally changed your life. I'm talking about information that was embedded in a two-mile-long ice core that was pulled up from the center of Greenland. Tell us what you found. Usually when we see a history of the climate, we find the climate behaves itself. It changes slowly and gradually, and occasionally something weird happens. And so we found the record of some of these weird jumps in the climate. So what can we learn about the Earth from that ice core sample? And uh, how reliable is taking a reading from it? Yeah. We, we find a lot about history. And as you know, if we understand history, it helps us figure out what to do. It doesn't tell us what to do. And when we look at the history of climate, we see that CO2 matters, that the sun matters, and that occasionally really strange things happen. And that sh helps us decide what is wise for the future. So what did you see happening? You, you saw lots of abrupt change happening in that ice core that you pulled out. Absolutely. There, there are places that we, we should be watching because that's where weirdness happens. And so, so usually if you push the climate a little bit, it changes a little bit. And occasionally if you push it, something falls over. Now, past record, though, does not predict future performance. And, and you said back at a 2002 uh, meeting of the National Academy of Science Committee on Abrupt Climate Change that our comfortable climate will likely change abruptly and perhaps violently. The, the, the history is that there are these surprises. So if, if you take your best estimate of what the climate is going to do, it's probably pretty good. And you can rely on that to, to a fair degree. And then occasionally something weird happens, something surprises you. And you just have to recognize you'll never get it perfect. And sort of be ready for the surprise when it comes. How? how far off do you think it might be? <laughs> well, surprises. The problem with them is how do you predict them? If you're sitting in a canoe and you lean a little bit, the canoe leans a little bit. But exactly where do you lean too far that it falls over? That's hard. Now, I think most people agree that the, the planet is warming. What there isn't agreement on is whether it's human-induced warming or, or because of some other cause. Now, we're burning fossil fuels at a million times faster than nature created them. What role do you think fossil fuels are playing in all of this? I believe we now have high confidence that humans are the primary force. Or the sun matters. A lot of things matter. but. CO2 makes it warmer, that's physics. Physicists are actually very good at answering nice, simple questions like that, and more CO2 makes it warmer. It is getting warmer. If we take a, a model of the climate system and tell it what nature has done, it matches the older changes, but it doesn't match the recent ones. If we tell it what nature has done and what humans have done, it matches the recent ones. And that's been done with many different models. So the confidence that we're the primary driver right now is rising. Now, you say we can make the situation worse relatively easily. We're doing it all the time. Um, what can we do to, to uh, reduce the problem. There are really bright people who are looking at this, some of them on the public paycheck, and there are smart people that say that if we spend decades thinking about this really hard and funding bright students to work on it, that you can solve it for something like 1% of the economy. It's not, it's big enough, it matters, that's real money, but it's not insurmountable, it's not an end of the world thing if bright people are thinking about it. Now, how do you respond to people like the senior editor of the American Spectator who refers to uh, people with a message similar to yours as global warming alarmists? They also say that there's a concerted effort to magnify the problem because um, more government money will be flowing to scientists who are talking about a disaster as opposed to those who say all is right with the world. Right. I mean, my, my colleagues, when I talk to them, when I watch them work, I think they're cautious. I think they're careful. They clearly are outliers on both sides. But I think by and large that the scientists are trying to do the right thing and that they're trying to get it right. And so I, I don't see 
see my friends, my colleagues out here saying, please give me wads of money and I'll scare you. Um, I, I don't think that's what we're about. Now, you use the word abrupt climate change. Define that for us. Uh, we defined it two ways. One is, is, is something that's faster than the cause, so you push a little bit and it falls over. The other one is something fast enough that people or, or ecosystems have trouble dealing with it. You also talk about uh, what you call no regret strategies for dealing with this. Give us an example of something that would be a no regret, a no brainer, something yeah. we just ought to be doing. Um, I rode my bicycle out here this morning. I like to be able to ride my bicycle many places. When I do, I save a little bit of fossil fuel and I get a little bit healthier and happier. It would be really nice when the new subdivisions go in if they all had bike trails so I could ride on them whether or not you care about global warming because we like to ride on them and they're good, they're healthy. Now, in addition to, to riding your bike to work, um, there's a senior scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research who is uh, suggesting that perhaps we do what a volcano does when it erupts, and that is to, to throw particulates up into the atmosphere that would create a haze and, and redirect some of that sunlight away from the Earth. How plausible is something like that? Yeah, geoengineering, um, it's possible. Uh, it's one of those things that if we wanted to, if we want to tell the government, the policy makers, what their options are. We should know about this. Uh, there are things that worry me about it. If, if we burn the fossil fuels and, and raise temperature and then we block the sun and lower temperature, we sort of have to get it balanced right. And if we go a long ways and we're lowering the temperature a lot because we've raised the temperature a lot and then the thing breaks, oh my goodness, what an abrupt climate change that would be. So there's things that worry me about that, but I think we should know about it. It is interesting, it is possible. Yeah, speaking of knowing about it, uh, the, an oceanographer with Columbia University is talking about giant machines that would suck up the carbon monoxide and pump it underground into, into carbon-rich rocks, for example. Yeah, yeah, this is Klaus Lochner's work. This is very interesting. That's also in... <laughs> There's not going to be one answer to this. There's going to be a bunch. And we need the, the bright people. We need the diversity of ideas now. And we need to figure out which ones work and which ones don't so that then the scientific, the engineering community can give the policy makers enough choices that they can do the right thing. Now, Jim Hansen, who is with NASA, he's President Bush's uh, chief uh, climate modeler, he says that we have 10 years to turn this around to avoid disaster. Is that an accurate prediction? I hope he's wrong, because I think that it's, it's slow to turn. I would really be happier if, if within that 10 years that we were working harder. We had more bright scientists and engineers down the road working on this, because I think eventually we will need the energy sources. Oil will run out eventually. Um, if we burn all the oil, all the coal first, we will change the climate with high confidence. And so I would love to see more bright students and bright colleagues down there in our building and next door working on this now. I think it would be good for us. Now, Governor Rendell is suggesting um, uh, air quality standards similar to California's. What, though, can the average Pennsylvanian do um, yeah. to reduce the problem? Yeah, well, of course, the first thing would be to send us your bright students. <laughs> we'll, we'll do well by them, so please. Um, and, and the next thing is to look for these no regret strategies, the nice, easy things that save you money, that save you time, and that, that also help the environment some. All right. Thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.